Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Madhuri Perry. I'm from AWS. Uh, I've been working here for almost three years. Today, I'm going to present this session on building paths with EKS for regulated enterprises. So we'll go into little nuances of uh, what twist uh, regulation brings to the table and how you design for systems there. Um, I'm co-presenting here from Amir Abdelhalam. He is our customer fidelity representative, and he is the head of cloud architecture there. Thank you for coming. Let's get started. So um, this is the agenda we'll be going, going over today, and uh, I'll just go over initially and set the stage on what are the aspects fidelity is going to cover in the later half of the presentation. So to get started, these are some of the financial or regulatory challenges. I believe these apply to um, any um, industry vertical that deals with PCI data or even HIPAA data probably, but some more than others have um, absolutely um, must produce evidence to um, show the auditors they are doing all this work. These include traceability of the changes that you are deploying, developers don't have access to production, whoever is making changes to the data, if the customers are owning credit cards and uh, their personal investment accounts, then um, you don't want even the administrator of the cluster to have access to that data, um, those kind of stuff, and you want to make sure that everything is change controlled, Any uh, changes you apply in your clusters or uh, anything that changes your data has uh, traceability. You're able to show that in case of any severity issues, you're able to produce evidence that event has occurred. These are all the steps we have taken to mitigate. So this is what we are trying to address today. So when you take a uh, look at EKS, basic architecture, Everybody here must be knowing that EKS is a managed Kubernetes service produced, uh, provided by Amazon Web Services. So you get an endpoint uh, represented in the top here by xyz.eks.amazonaws.com, and all you are doing is um, provisioning your worker nodes within your cluster and installing any plugins that are required for your applications on these um, worker nodes. So your interface for managing the cluster is through kubectl, which is on the left-hand side of the screen. So while the last slide looks simple enough at a very high layer, um, when you dig deeper and look at it from a developer point of view or an operations point of view, what you are seeing is this orange rectangle here is the one that essentially is giving you the endpoint. The rest of the components are something that you have to configure in your environment to make sure that you are addressing all the needs that have to be met for developers and any stakeholders in your organization, including the site reliability engineering teams. So um, the ALB, NLB box in the top that represents the ingress, egress controller options, you would probably um, configure who all from your partners uh, would need to have access, and not just partners in production, but even internally during development and testing, which business units can access what clusters in any multi-cluster environment. So um, while connectivity is a portion of the item that you will be taking care of, the networks and the policies, the IP addresses, who has uh, access to what microservices, all those have to be controlled at a very fine-grained level to the lowest level possible. Um, in addition, you might be familiar with the storage uh, persistent volumes and volume claims that you have to use across your microservices as well. The point is um, when you put all of these components together and look through the lenses of DevOps, security, network, uh, monitoring, it's no simple task. So 
when you have developers that have to move, you need to enable them at as fast as possible rapid pace of development with the agility piece, then what you are um, ending up with is a wide variety of tool set for different teams. On top of it, you have a wide variety of languages you're developing the code with, and you're leveraging and wanting to use the powerful feature sets that Kubernetes brings to the table. And all of these have to work together in a way that produce uh, meaningful business results for you. So you made yourself a case for building a platform as a system which works for you in your environment. So with that, let's uh, take a look at some of the four aspects. The first story here is about security. So when you're taking a look at security, um, in AWS, there are few native services that you probably will be using for secret management, uh, which allow you to encrypt secrets and store in the secret store, and your microservices would access those secrets um, in a way that only that particular microservice has to be able to um, be able to read and write to it. The second aspect is um, beyond the AWS native services, when you go into the Kubernetes world, you have these user accounts, which are the human um, accounts that you have to provision for anyone that has to access, connect to the cluster. The second layer is the service accounts. Those are the accounts through which uh, pods are running system processes on the worker nodes. And you want to think about the namespaces these pods are running in. Which microservices have to have access to which namespace has to be defined clearly as well. Um, on top of this, you have Kubernetes using its own rollback uh, role-based access control are back, and you have to make sure you bridge the gap with AWS IAM through the IAM authenticator. So when you are using AWS IAM authenticator, it's bridging this uh, world between AWS IAM and the Kubernetes are back. So um, we want to make sure that we define these pods and the microservices um, that are representing these pods with appropriate namespaces, service accounts, user accounts, so the access control is appropriately set. The next in line is basically this slide shows you what I have just spoken about earlier. Left you are seeing Cube CTL or Cube Cuddle, which is passing your AWS IAM credentials through the API server header, and it's going to validate with the service, get the token back, and store that key value, and then provide um, validate with the Kubernetes are back whether this user is a valid user. And if it's a valid user, what are all the permissions the user uh, has for this particular access command that he's perform he or she is performing? And eventually you get a net of action allowed or denied. So moving on from the security aspect to the network controls piece, there are two pieces to the network control. The first one is who all can access the application, um, who, who can come in basically. That's the first piece. And that's set or defined usually by defining your network policy. And when you define your network policy, um, you are trying to achieve network segmentation, which means you want to make sure that the reporting service is accessible only probably by business units um, and not by developers in production. And you want to make sure certain uh, reports are accessible only to customers and not even any administrators within the EKS admin space either. The second aspect is you want to sometimes achieve tenant isolation. So you might want to define deny all by default and selectively add microservices that have um, access or will be granted access to uh, this particular application. So when you face such a situation, you typically go with um, network policy plugin, and in our case, we use um, Calico here, and I'll show an example in a couple of slides how that would look like. The next 
piece of the puzzle here is at a network layer beyond the controls, you have to manage your IP address space as well. So there are three layers of um, IP addresses in any Kubernetes um, cluster, right? The first one is the cluster IP address space. The second one is your pod IP address space. And all this is operating in AWS environment. So you have your VPC uh, address space as well. So you might be like, whoa, there are so many address spaces. How am I going to achieve management on top of all of this? The answer is, if you use the CNI plugin AWS provides for you, it kind of um, collapses all of these three layers into a single layer, and all your pods would get an IP address within the VPC CIDR block. For any uh, custom requirements, like if you have um, any requirements on do not reserve um, XYZ IPs in the secondary IP space on this particular node. So what happens is the CNI plugin, I must say, it uses something called IP address manager. That's the LIPAM daemon. That detects what instance the CNI plugin is running on as a daemon set and pre uh, assigns all of these IPs on that particular instance. So what if you have a custom requirement where you don't want to do that and want to keep your IP addresses, only a certain portion of them, as warm IPs, um, so there is no delay in attaching an ENI to the instance, and rather um, want to customize these settings. You could do that with the CNI plugin um, through custom settings in the plugin as well. Of course, this is deployed as a daemon set, which means it runs one copy per worker node that you are running. So, um, so when you translate all of this, what you are saying is, I want to achieve a functionality in, if you take a standard three-tier microservice, or an application rather, you have your, <coughs> excuse me, you have your web server parts that are running, and you have your application server parts that are running. <coughs> and you have your backend database. But you do want to define a rule in which you do not want web server to directly access the database, as indicated by these uh, red cross marks in the diagram. If you want to do that, you could define a policy, something like this, where you are saying your application server can, act, can be accessed but by only your web server. So what this is defining is only these two pieces can talk to each other, so anything else is not allowed. So you are controlling this at a network layer to even stop the traffic from coming up. So um, to sum it up, uh, from a network layer, the critical thing to do is manage your IP address space, make sure that your pods are in the appropriate namespace, and define your network policy documents based on who is allowed per microservice. So if you are able to do all these three, you should be in a pretty de decent shape from a control point of view. The next topic is uh, how am I deploying or managing all of these changes and getting them to production? That's your CI CD workflow. On once the developers are making these changes, you want as much as possible declarative changes. So in the last example, the policy document, it can be version controlled and stored. As changes happen to it, your build engine or system should be able to build it out or detect the change and push it out to your um, final deployment system. So um, if you have a lot of changes for any deployment package, many um, enterprises do have application config files, software changes, and many more that you will see later. Um, you might want to uh, use something to simplify all of this package management and deployment process. And that's where Helm comes in. So Helm is your package management tool in Kubernetes, which gives you all of this functionality. Um, there are three, three main components we want to discuss here. The first aspect is um, there is a Helm client, which is um, 
uh, client side version that you would use from your desktop or laptop to control or work with Helm Tiller, which is the server side component of it. So where you deploy this component um, also matters and which namespace this Helm runs in gives you access or permission to deploy to all of those microservices in your production. So you want to think about it, like from your admin point of view, who all should have permission to deploy to these um, different applications or multiple clusters, um, multi-user clusters, and that way you can start designing your system in a way that makes sense for you so that your developers have their required permissions and your operational folks have their own permissions and admins have their own permissions too. Um, so it helps you, uh, these charts are a simplified way of communicating what all can be um, installed and upgraded and of course you can version control all of these. Um, so we just spoke about these multiple components and the sample helm command looks like this. So here you're using the helm command to install a release of MySQL into your pods. So last but not the least is the visibility and monitoring of this entire application that's going to run in production for you. So when you talk about monitoring, everybody comes up almost with a different answer because their stake into the system is different. Their role demands a different level of visibility. So the whole idea is from your business point of view, you absolutely must establish KPIs, the key performance indicators, meaning how do I detect a healthy system? How do I detect when it is getting to be unhealthy? What if the pods are operating at greater than 70%? Is that normal? Maybe it's normal if it's only for 10 minutes in a day, but if it extends for half an hour, maybe something else is not wrong. Um, not correct, so someone should investigate. Those kind of metrics and alerts you want to capture. So now the question is, yes, okay, now you told me that the pods are not healthy, but where all am I getting these messages or metrics from? Well, there are different components in your Kubernetes. First, you have your horizontal pod um, scaler, then you have your cluster autoscaler. Maybe scaling should have happened when it is greater than 50%, but it didn't occur. Then which log should you go to? That would be a cluster autoscaler log and a HPA logs. So then you want to look at cluster-wide metrics. What else is happening in the cluster? Is some other microservice upstream or downstream failing? which is causing a backlog in my particular service. All of these are a comprehensive plan for your visibility and monitoring. So there is no single answer to it. The mechanism through which you derive your answer is still the same. The approach is the same. Start with your KPIs, work backwards on each metric where what all logs are providing those for you, what all are the data sources that would feed this to you. So with that, I wanted to hand it over to Amir from Fidelity. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much. So uh, let me just start by introducing Fidelity. So who, who here is like, you guys have like uh, an account in Fidelity or had an account in Fidelity? Oh wow, okay. Well, that concluded. Everybody had the account, so we're good. <laughs> so um, I'm just going to start like by one slide, basically explaining why we did what we did, which was a lot. And then after that, we're going to go like in technology, explaining like step by step how we did it. But first of all, like why we did that, we're running about twenty, uh, about uh, twenty trillion dollar of business cash flow, about uh, fifty thousand employees, about fifteen thousand IT. Uh, about 1,000 of application, 800 DevOps teams globally across multiple data centers, multi-clouds. And the whole idea about building a platform for us was uh, critical in order to do like time to market and to, in order to build like a scalable solution that will fit all the DevOps teams. And also it will fit them for building a way to do like agility and enable all the innovations that you can get when you start migrating into the cloud and enabling our own application to communicate outside with the SaaS solutions. Uh, I think you know Amazon this morning in the keynote they announced about like another 50 
you know, services. And we want to start like using all of those and connecting all of those to our application hosted inside EKS and inside Kubernetes. So the idea for us was basically we have to build that platform. And the platform itself will give all the DevOps teams and all the developers that capability. And it will let them not to worry about the plumbing and what's underneath the hood and how they can deploy to Kubernetes and how they can manage it. It will also take care of all the reliability and scalability piece of the solution. How the solution is still scalable, how you can build like a high availability between multi-regions and active active solution between these regions, how you can high, build hyper cloud model where you can build some of that workload in the data centers and some of that workload in the cloud and you can move that workload in between. Uh, in addition to that, you know, um, how you can, we can monitor that solution, how we can make sure when we have an outages or issues, um, how we can find the root cause quickly, and how we can prevent it from happening. In addition, of course, there is cost factor. It's not about cost saving, but mainly about cost to charge back and how we can find about um, how much it costs to run your application in containers and in EKS. So with that, uh, there was like more of like, uh, like tenants or guidelines for us for how to build this platform. We mainly was like using Kubernetes standards in CNCF, multi-tendency, uh, building pipelines, making sure we are you know working with all the regulators around the ISO and around the SOC one compliance, and uh, adding like kind of like a monitoring tool and other tool in the platform. I'm just gonna skip quickly and go like directly into the technology, and that's how the platform will look like. So our platform basically, and if you guys like, if you see this picture or this diagram, you will relate it to that diagram somehow. You will find that actually you're building that. The first generation of the platform, usually it was like used to call like, you know, some of the rebuild software like Cloud Foundry, which is kind of like a bit software. You have to build it and you have to maintain it and you have to manage it all the time. And you have to get all your development teams to comply to how to deploy and build build backs and deploy them. The second generations, which is using containers and Kubernetes and serverless, is the one that usually like run in a cloud, it run as a managed service, it's a pluggable architecture, so you will be able to change your DevOps tools, you should be able to replace some of the security tools, your monitoring tools, and even the infrastructure underneath the hood, like you know, uh, you'll be able to use like you know, some component in serverless, some component in EKS, or in Kubernetes, and so on. How's that look like inside EKS? This is our platform, which is kind of like extension for the first diagram that you guys saw early, uh, the, the colors here actually does represent some of those functions. So you will see the orange color is basically the EKS managed services itself, uh, while the blue ones are more about the tooling that we used. Uh, and you see the ingress is kind of like a blue. Uh, the DevOps tools itself, the CI CD pipeline, the ways that we connect to that platform, and the infrastructure as a code underneath the hood of how we're building these clusters, and then the telemetry pieces. And the next few slides, I'm gonna show you like exactly how we build each one of those. If you see the circles here, that's actually the part of the, or the engineering part that we invested time to build the plumbing and build the integration between these components. So uh, we have like four stakeholders, if you guys notice here, like our DevOps teams, which we have many, many of them. We have our SRE teams or our performance teams. We have our EKS admin teams, which is the administration teams that are responsible to build these clusters and to build that platform. And of course, we have the user on the other side which is coming to use the platform and using our applications. Um, one of the circles here is a red circle, which is basically how we're connected. If you have about 15,000 developers and you have all the tooling for automation to deploy the CD tools, and we get many of them, we have to have a standard way to communicate and to, co to connect to that clusters. And the way we build that, we start thinking about this cluster this way. So the cluster for us, if we go back a little bit like in how Linux was built. Linux was built when you have a Linux server, you will get like, believe it or not, we used to have CDs, you install the CD in the server itself, and once you does the installation, it will ask you what's the root password. And once you get the root password, you will have a root user, and then you'll have a root group. And that root group will be able to create other groups, right? It could be a Tomcat, it could be MySQL, it could be application ENP, and each one of these groups will have a set of users. And also, we'll have a set of folders or directories where you install the software, Right? And they start the communication between all these teams through IPs and ports. And that was the traditional way of doing that in Linux. The way we're doing that right now in our EKS implementation, that we have multiple clusters. So imagine one cluster is equivalent to one, like one Linux server. And each one of that clusters will have an admin group. We call them the admin users. And these admin users have a set 
or their own namespace, and that namespace will contain all the daemon sets and all the plugins and all the drivers that's required to run these clusters. In addition to that, we extended the namespace concept itself. We created the CRD. We called it the namespace group. A namespace group basically is a group of namespaces that connected to one of the teams to deploy a couple of applications. So if you see that, architecture, how it's been done inside the cluster. So the cluster itself is connected to our active directory in the corporate. And then there is mapping between our active directory and between the IAMs. And this IAMs is being created automatically or through some of our engineering process in the back end. And that's connected back to the EKS R back model. And our back model is connected to our extended CRD that connected to the namespaces itself. In addition to that, we have a, a one of the namespaces we call the cluster namespace manager or the root namespace. And that is a namespace where we have all this component to manage that cluster. We spent about like a month and a half building this process, all this integration between ADs to IMs to our backs to namespaces. This way, when the teams actually get are connected to the cluster, they only are seeing their own namespaces where they can do deployment, they can do management, they can do monitoring, as you can do operation around the namespaces and around their application only. If we go a little bit in deep in that, how this cluster is being architected, you will see the cluster architecture itself is being split between three availability zones. Each one of these availability zones will have multiple EC2 machines or multiple nodes. Each one of these nodes will have its own kubelets and CNI plugins and so on. Now, the cluster management namespace or the root management namespace, it will have its own mini daemon sets. For example, like take the monitoring daemon sets. If you use like a tool like external tool, or CloudWatch, or external tools, external third party tools for monitoring, you will need a way to integrate these tools to your clusters. And that's managed by our EKS admin teams, or our managers, or our root, root users. Similar to that, our IM teams themselves, who manage the access from bots or from one certain application into an RDS in the back end, or a DynamoDB, and so on. We have another one about what we call the bootstrap pro, uh, controller, or how we build the ingress. So when application get deployed, it automatically get configured in our ALBs and automatically get configured in the Route 53. And the way we're doing that, actually we extended the ALB core, uh, ingress core, to allow like multiple ALBs integration and to have a shareable solution for all ALBs that will be able to route and reroute this traffic into all the namespaces and to, into all the bots. Uh, in addition to that, like, you know, we have additional ones about certification management because we have very high requirement around certification and each one of the applications will require its own certs in this case. So we have a certification management demon sets as well that's running. Um, there is also placeholder for future services like the service mesh services, uh, the serverless that we're hopefully going to run on top of Kubernetes, uh, how we do backup and DR, and so on. In top of all of that, of course, there is the ALPs and there is Route 53s, and that's how our cluster is being built. So to get to that cluster, once this cluster is being engineered, we created what we called an EKS Connect. EKS Connect is a tool right now, it's running in Fidelity for about like, you know, um, 30 plus clusters, and it's running by like hundreds of developers at this moment, and hopefully we're gonna be open sourcing this tool very soon. The tool itself, it run in Linux, it run in Windows, it run in Mac OS, and the idea is that it has a kube cuttle with authenticator and with the configuration piece itself and including the Helm client. All of that get installed in your machine. And when you run this tool, it will look like that. You are user 123, you're getting to the cluster, you will add a username and password, and it will come back asking you, you are connected to three or four or five clusters as admin or as a user or as a deployer or a read-only mode and so on you will check which one you want to use. And once you do that, you will be syndicated to that cluster to do that role. In addition to that, this tool actually run in silent mode as well. So all our CD tools, we have many of them. It run under Jenkins, not under Spinnakers, under Concourse, under IBM you deploy. It will run silently. The tool will get downloaded using the CI CD tool. It will do the authentication authorization. And once it does that, it will do the deployment and then it will work. The point of that is using EKS Connect or using your own tool, you should standardize the ways that you connect to these clusters. Otherwise, it's going to be a mess. <laughs> Once the teams get connected, like the DevOps team, the EKS admin teams, uh, our SRE teams, and our users, they, also, they always get connected for a purpose or for a reason. 
So our EKS admin are very focused in how this account that hold EKS is being configured and managed. How to create an EKS cluster, how to upgrade an EKS cluster, how to dehydrate, and we do like you know policy for dehydration EC2s under these clusters. How to do backup for clusters, how to do DRs for clusters. They also managing all the resources underneath the cluster itself, the networking policies, uh, the storage that's been using under these clusters, the EC2 machines themselves, the AMIs, and how to create the name spaces for other teams. The DevOps teams are more focused about application management. In this case, they are focused about how to do continuous deployment, how to manage the canaries and the blue-green deployment, how they do a configuration management and secret management. The SRA teams are more focused about stability, which in this case, the monitoring piece, the logging, uh, the application logging, the performance metrics itself, and that's, that's the purpose that they're coming with. Our users themselves have their own requirement. So our users coming with their own ingress and routing. And they're also coming around with their own security. So how they manage their certifications and how the certificate is being managed. Their session and caching requirements. They all have their own sessions and caching requirement. So I'm going to show you like in the next few slides some of the stories, how we are building that right now. What we're trying to do is basically invest in some of the engineering processes behind the scene to make that common across all this DevOps team. Uh, first story is a story that we have the EKS admin teams themselves want to build a new cluster. So we have a tool called EKS Manager. And hopefully this tool as well should hopefully going to be an open source one. The tool itself will have an input. It's a CLI tool, and it does have an input of YAML charts. And that YAML chart will have a specification about that cluster. What's your cluster name? What's the description of that cluster? Which region the cluster is landing in? And how many nodes you need there? What the specs of this node? How many IMs on? What the IMs specs themselves? What is a secret management tool behind the scene? What kind of monitoring tool you need to be installed? Once the specs get added, it will run, the tool itself will run, it will create the account, it will set up the IAM rules, it will set up all the security groups, it will set up the VBCs information, it will create the control plane, it will create the nodes, and it will run the IAM integration with RBAC. It will also install that root act, you know, namespace with all these goodies, all these daemon sets on top of that. And after that, it will do validation to make sure that that cluster is up and running and functioning and ready for operation. Story number two. The EKS admin team right now have a cluster, and they are looking to add teams, boarding teams. So they're going to run another EKS manager tool. In this case, the teams themselves have specification. That's our AD group. That's the users. That's our admin users. That's the rules that we need. That's our namespaces. This is a function that we need there. And within like 10 to 15 minutes, all I what I described before in the last few slides around how, how we build this mapping between ADEs and IMs on our back that would be built, the namespaces would be configured, the ingress route rules itself would be configured, and it's ready for deployment. After 10 minutes, story number three will come. The same team now is ready for deployment. So deployment or CCD processes, there is like many flavors here. Uh, it's like, you know, I'm, I'm from New York City, so the commute to New York is nightmares. There's a couple of ways to do that. You can ride the train. The train itself is going to have like about 300, 400 people. And you all go like every hour. You have control in like how much your expenses, monthly expenses for commute. But if you miss a train, you have to get to the next train. It's a very restricted way to do deployment. The next way, if you're driving your own private car, and when you do that, you have more flexibility, but it's more expensive. And there's also a third way, which is doing like kind of like a carpooling. This is a carpooling model. In this case, we are managing all the tool chains behind the scene. Our secret management tool chains, our repos, um, our way we do scanning, and also our repos that, and our CD tools that we use. We don't restrict which CD tool should be used. So you can bring your own tool into the EKS cluster, or you can use ours. Uh, there is three, if you see in the left-hand side here, the development team are very focused in building the helm charts and building the images and deploying them. The security team is very focused about creating the secrets and the certificate management as well for these deployments. And the other team, they go, they do scanning and vulnerability scanning in these images. They make sure the image is certified and they sign it. And also they make sure that everybody's doing his own purpose in terms of like security, certifications, the secrets are being valid and so on. Then the green line, it actually shows what's happening in our data, side, data center toward what's happening on the other side of the house, which is in the, in the cloud. 
So whatever tool you're going to be using, you're also going to be deploying the Helm charts. You're going to be promoting this image to the set of ECRs. And after that, the EKS itself will do that deployment, which is basically going to pull the images using the couplet into all the you know, nodes, and we will configure Route 53 and the ingress, and the deployment will happen. Uh, that, by itself, guarantee deployment. It will guarantee a blue-green type of deployment. It will guarantee canary type of deployment as well. What we are managing in the backs for that deployment is few things around the releases. So in the release side itself, we're managing how we are promoting images, how the images get promoted from a release number one to release number two. We're also managing how the Helm chart is being managed, where the Helm chart will be stored, how it's being versioned, and how it gets promoted into EKS. We're also managing how the application configuration is being deployed with this Helm chart. So we provide like standard and guidelines for how we do the deployment for the configuration themselves. The next one is a secret. And the difference between secret and configuration beside the encryption, we don't have version for secrets. So the secret in the new releases will be a different secret. And in order to do rollback, you have to make sure that you still have the old secret, you still have the same old configuration and the same old Helm charts, and as well the images. In addition for that, data, including data structure, including data manipulation, all of that have to be managed as well when we do deployment. And also all of that have to be validated if the teams would like to do a blue-green or would like to do a canary deployment. In addition, any SaaS solutions that we're using in AWS, any AI, AI or, AI or ML solutions or RDS, um, we have to make sure that this is being managed in the release as well. So it's not just an EKS release in this case. In addition to that, the IAM rules that have to support all that that need to be managed as well in that release. And last but not least, when you work in financial, you always know like about messaging and synchronization. So our team is very focused in building processes around that and building automation around that. I'm just gonna give you two examples here. One of the examples is how we're doing image promotions. So we're working actually right now with the uh, uh, AWS team, the ECR team, trying to build a standardization around this promotion for all the ECRs so they can have the same image being promoted across all regions. Right now, we're doing that manually. The other example is like how we work with HashiCorp and Vault to do authorization and authentication for the secret management piece. Uh, and we have our own init container. So when a new bot comes that requires a secret, an init bot will come in this case, and it will start first. It will authenticate to Vault, and it will grab the token. And once that is done, it will integrate that into our application bot or application container, which will grab the secret and it will run based on that. And this is the processes that you guys want to like invest in. And with that, I'm going to move to the next story, which is basically focused in the SRE team. So I'm not going to discuss any, any monitoring tool. There is many in the market, and they're all claiming they're doing the same thing. But I think it's more about the philosophy itself, like how we do monitoring for container. Monitoring containers is the hardest part of the whole equation here. And in order to do that, you always have to classify your data. What's your data input? What's the data classification? What do you want to do with this data? So the data input, the way we classify the data input in Fidelity is around like four categories. The infrastructure, which means all the compute, all the network, and all the storage that we're using underneath the hood. All of that is being monitored. Next one is our management tier, the EKS management control plane all the CD tools, all the tool chains that we're using with them, the ALPs, and the Route 53. All of that is being monitored. Number three is the bots themselves, the containers themselves. And we, we basically monitor all the events that we have in these containers. When containers start, when container goes down, when auto-scale events happen, when a crash for container, all of that is being monitored. And then last but not least, all the application that running inside this container, all the processes that run inside these containers. That as well is being monitored. That this data get classified as three categories. One of them is the logs. Second one is about the health of each one of this component. And the third one is about the matrices themselves. Some examples here it could be the application response time. It could be the couplet response time. It could be the EC2 availability. It could be how long it takes you to connect to the EKS endpoint. That's some of the matrices that we are collecting. We're getting this data, and then we can read from this data at automatic dashboards. So we write our own dashboard that become automatically, when the cluster get created, it come rebuild with its own dashboards. And then we provide a template for these dashboards as it will for the developers, so they can start like building them when they add more applications. Um, 
With that, we started this project internally right now, where we start building, uh, collecting all this data and building baselines. This baseline for the clusters, for the management here, for the containers themselves. And the idea here is like if you have a baseline and you can track the behavior of your application and the behavior of your cluster, you will be able to, to predict and you will be able to find any spike in that cluster, any issue. And you can, based on that, you can have a, a kind of like a recovery action and recover that before issue happen. And that's like a big, like, you know, I think it's a very future in terms of like intermediary about the AI ops model. Next one is about how we actually managing that cluster from cost perspective. So this is a concept tool, we don't have it yet, but we're building that as, as we speak right now. It's mainly about one important question, how actually, what is your cost of running a container in production? What is the cost of running an application in production? And that cost will vary over time because you know, with auto scaling processes, you will find like you know, your application might be three containers in one day and 15 containers the next day. So how much is the cost for running your application in production? How many containers you're running by EC2 machines? What is your IP distributions? Are we consuming enough IPs? Are we wasting IPs? Uh, and are we actually overutilizing the EC2 machine? Are we underutilizing the EC2 machines? Are we using enough storage? Do we need additional storage? Um, all of that actually is being done right now. We're trying to build algorithms around it so we can do this calculation and find more. In addition to that, we're trying to provide some of this tooling as a service with some GUIs around audits, around vulnerabilities, around scanning, around the post, you know, the algae post problems as themselves. And we're building like a GUIs and tools for the developers and for the SRI teams and the admin teams themselves. Last is when you start this journey, we started a few months ago, we all thought about like resolving all these issues inside like one clusters. And then we found ourselves like having few clusters in one regions. And I think the next step is really like how we can build a service mesh layer to build a secure communication between all those clusters. The first issue is mainly how we can do secure communication between bots inside the clusters. And that's what we found in the only way to do it is, is that we go outside and come back using a certificate and management, or we can build a service mesh on top of that where you can have something like Envoy running as a sidecar containers that will con contain a certificates. And that way you can guarantee that automated like security in terms of like communicating between bots inside the cluster. Next issue is really between clusters themselves, how we can programmably build that traffic in a secure way. And the third issue is like when you build that in one region and second region and then in your data centers, you will need a way to build this integration and this traffic shaping between our data centers and between all the regions that we have in future. So service mesh is the future. And that's really our next step. I think you know, um, AWS is working hard with us around that. We're going to be like, you know, investing our time next year, hopefully, in building this service mesh layer across all the cluster we're having in that platform. With that, thank you so much. We have time for Q&A. If anyone has questions, happy to answer them. Yes. That's a question for Amir. Sure. So uh, right now, we have about uh, 15 cluster live. The plan is to extend that. Um, I, I can't tell you the exact number, but the plan is to, that's going to be extendable to over 100. Uh, I don't have this information. And no, this means there's a lot of traffic going. Yeah, yeah. Yes, sir. Yes. Repeat the question. It's actually the, the Fidelity is cooperative that have multi business units. So that's deployed between business units. Each business unit will have its own requirement for how many clusters start to run. And it all depends on that, like, how operationally you're running DevOps teams. So uh, it. it No, actually, everybody's using that pattern at this moment. Yeah. And what do you, uh, EKS So I think it's the, the main thing about EKS or about Kubernetes in general, it was strategic direction. Like um, the idea is that you can run some of that workload in your data centers, and you can run some of that workload in AWS and in other cloud as well. You can move the workload itself seamlessly. ECS is a great product. We're using ECS as well. 
but it's locked inside AWS. You can, for example, move it back and forth. Uh, we're right now, I think we're, we're staying with EKS. Uh, we're not investing that much in Fargate. Right. So uh, I'm not familiar that much with the Cisco solution. I did hear about it. I think it was like, announced two days ago. Right. So at the, at the end of the day, you need a programmable way to do the communication between the cluster back and forth. Um, if you are like very like um, have high like requirement around security and how to do this communication back and forth. So also, if you have a requirement around how you do the traffics. So for example, if you have services that are running in your back end in the, main, in the data centers and the same services running in the AWS, and you want to do this traffic shaming in between like 25% goes there and 50, 75%, you will need the service mesh. You need to program that. However, I, I don't know like how the Cisco model works. Right. That's correct, yes. Hopefully soon, once we get the approval, we're going to be open sourcing them. Yes. We Hopefully have a question soon. here. Yes. Right. So one of the solutions we looked at was Istio. Uh, that was one of the solutions. Uh, and accessories. And I think Siri's answering that as well. <laughs> um, I don't know about AWS side. You want to talk yeah, about that? Yeah, we do have uh, partner solutions right now, but there has been a lot of customer interest on um, native solution. So we have taken that into feedback. I wouldn't be surprised if we come up with a service to address customer needs. Yeah. Uh, for service mesh in general. So. so it's more than certificate manager because certificate manager is going to be like it toward like it's installed in ELB. That's a traditional way. Yeah, yeah. But this one will work like it will, it will run actually a kind of like a sidecar containers that run in next to your application. So the management will be a little bit like different. It's, it's in, in, in process right now. We, we don't have it in production yet. No. No, we still we still researching. We're doing BUC with Bistio and a few other products. So we have one more question on this side. Yes, okay. yes sir. About how big is your EKS admin team, and how long so it's not one team. Right. So it's not one team. Uh, so the 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 how fidelity structure is like business units. It's like kind of their own companies basically. Few of them, and each one of them they have their own like IT organization, including their own CIOs and operation teams and. DevOps teams and many DevOps teams in this case. So it's really structured by product line, and the product line would have multi products, and each one of this product line would have their own DevOps team. Some DevOps team might be combined, you know, rules. They are EKS admin, and they are the DevOps, and they are the SRE at the same time. Some business units, I have the luxury to have multiple teams focusing each one of these roles. The, the centralized team, right. No, the centralized team actually is my team. The centralized team is building this process behind the scene. So we're actually, so we're acting kind of like an AWS for them. <laughs> oh, that team. So that team itself is about, uh, it's uh, actually consists of like two squads right now, or two scrum teams. Uh, one of them is engineering, and second one is more of like a, a solution team and more of an enablement team. So the one that the goals and you know work with the clients, or in this case the DevOps team, and get requirement and make sure that things are been working. Each one of these teams is about eight to ten. And they've been working for how long? The team is being constructed like six months ago. Both of them. Yeah. Each of those business units have their own cluster or do they share clusters? Uh, they don't share clusters. So they have their own clusters. They have their own clusters, yes. And EKS service. Uh, the, the, the supporting multi cluster in mesh, service mesh right now is not there yet. It's not, I mean, uh, we did some research and I, I don't think there's anyone in the market right now that does the whole like multi cluster support. It's not there. It's in BOC, we're working with Amazon, we're working with Google around that. Hopefully in 2019 that will be productionized. 
And that's why I was saying it's more of like a future view, but it's not there yet. The, well, the, the cluster itself have like a four stakeholders. The DevOps teams, the, and, and it's role more than a team. DevOps rules, and the SRE, the admins who manage the clusters, and of course, you know, the, the client or the end users. Is that, do you find that difficult to manage where they all kind of want their own kind of the flavor of that, or they have to Well, this is actually the beauty of, of Kubernetes. That's one of the things that's why actually we went with Kube itself or with EKS. So I uh, can give you like one example, like uh, Route 53 is using very commonly between all these teams, but there is some backend offices that are using InfoBlock, right? So and for these teams, we have to draft the solution a little bit. So we add a different name and sets for them that the, that's the integration was InfoBlock instead of Route 53. And that integration was like very simple, it took like a day to do it, because there's already like daemon set in the market that does the integration with InfoBlock, enable it and so. So the, again, the idea it's a bloggable architecture, so you can blog and play these tools or these daemon sets when needed. So there's no like constraints that you guys all have to follow that. Even in the DevOps tools themselves, the CI, CD pipeline tools, you don't have to like the follow. Teams, do they contribute kind of some of this functionality as well? Yes, yeah, yeah. So uh, it's actually, uh, it's interesting model, it's collaborative model, so every team actually is collaborating some of the teams are very interested around like the DMZ capabilities and how we can enable that in the DMZ side. Some of the teams are very interested about how we do high availability and how we do DRs. So, and, and it's good, it's kind of like extension for our team and it makes them actually part of the solutions and it works. So for, for the security on Yes, there's a couple of tools, I think there was one session actually yesterday around that in Master Kubernetes. Uh, there's a couple of tools in the market. Right now we're using Kube to IM. That's the one we're using. Uh, I think KIM is another one in the market, but it has some of the vulnerabilities, so I wouldn't recommend this one. Uh, AWS is coming with one hopefully soon. Gonna be announced. We are not using Aqua. No. Aqua, is Block, all those are partner products for vulnerability scanning. Um, Clear OS is one of the open source ones for image scanning. Yes. It's a CRD. It's a CRD. It's a, yeah. So it's an extension, basically, that we added. We extended that. Uh, I didn't hear the question. Uh, it's about the group namespace groups. Yes. Right. I mean, we only had like 30 minutes, so I couldn't cover it all. <laughs> but the idea, basically, you have the, the way Vault it work, it worked in multi-data center for high availability, right? And it could be in multi-regions as well. So what we build, we build kind of a neat container, and that container is basically have the way to authenticate into Vault and make sure like it does like, you know, uh, in case of any failover, it will go to the right, like region, close by region, right? And it will inherit the RBAC model that you have in Kubernetes, and it will go with that rule into Vault. In the same time, in Vault, actually, we have another process that's running to build the namespaces in Vault themselves. So we have two ways, like, you know, team, security team coming into Vault, building a Vault namespace that has this secret. And uh, application deployment coming with the init container, that init container will syndicate to that namespace using the same RBAC, and that's how you can grab that token. Once the token is grabbed, the unique container itself will hand over this token to the application containers, and the application container will grab the secret and move on. That's correct, yes. That work actually is done right now. I think HashiCorp is going to be announcing that in the next release of, I shouldn't say that, but yeah. <laughs> <laughs> They are not version control. You're talking maps, that's secret. And that's why I'm saying, like, you know, deployment when you do canary deployment is difficult. It's not easy. You have to make sure that you're covering all of that. So you have to do it manually or Not really. You don't have to do it manually. Just, you know, you're going to be different version of, chart, of your Helm charts. And then that Helm chart, you will have different secret information. And one way to control it, which we see across customers, is you restart the pod whenever you um, have a new secret. So you get the latest one always from the secrets manager. In addition to that, you can also make sure that whenever Vault rotates the password, even if it's 24 hours, all your pods are restarting themselves. And the very first time they start up, you read the latest. Yeah, that we have to Yes. Oh, 
Yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah, it's not the latest. It's not the latest by default. Yeah, because by, by um, there's one scenario use case, you can roll back the top, right? mm -hmm. but the secret is still the latest. Yes. That's the, the case now. I see. Good requirement. Thanks, everyone, for coming. Thank I guess you. it's too late now. Thank you.